Uh, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Second Peter, um, to Second Peter, we're going to be in uh, chapter three. We're going to be all over uh, today, uh, but last week we kind of talked about um, people and, and, and the new year and the new year being a restart. Uh, you know, we hear the kind of cliche things all the time: new year, new me. Uh, we hear all the the different ways that people describe the restart that is just another calendar year. I saw you know a couple different memes and jokes online. You know, or this, you know, people saying, oh, well, the gyms are going to be full again. And, oh, they went around the, the sun again one more time. And so, that, therefore, the, you know, they decided to do something different or decided to make promises again. And we talked a little bit last week about how when there's no action, that there is no change. And I'm just going to kind of extend on that uh, a little bit because um, I think the, the second half of that is understanding the promises of God for our life. And when we understand the promises of God for our life, we also understand that with that promise and some action, we can see amazing things in our personal walk with Jesus Christ. We can see healing, both physical, uh, emotional, spiritual. When we start to align um, ourselves with the word of God, making even just small changes on a regular basis, we will start to see things in our life uh, follow through and then fall into place. And not falling into place at random, but instead falling into place because God is honoring our actions in obedience and is blessing us that we otherwise wouldn't receive. And there are, there are withheld blessings for the disobedient children of God. And we see that through Hebrews. We're not going to have time to, to necessarily go there. You can kind of look it up yourself. Uh, but in second Peter chapter three, we have to remember this very, very powerful message um, that we have. And that message is that God is not slow or slack in his promises. And we actually preached on this um, probably almost two months ago. Uh, but I'm coming at it from a little bit of a different angle and a, a little bit, obviously, for the application of what it is that I'm going to be uh, preaching on here today. But um, God's promises uh, are not slow. They are not slack. Um, and his timing, that's another thing that we, we forget. When it comes to his timing with those promises, you know, we, we all sometimes always have this kind of opinion on it. And, you know, hands up for anyone here who questions God's timing in any situation. <laughs> we sit there and we go, why hasn't God done something about this yet? Why hasn't God addressed this, whether it's national, federal, whether it's personal? And it can be right down into your own family where you sit there and go, I do not know what God is doing and it doesn't look like this is glorifying him in any way. So why is something not being done in it with my prayers, with their prayers, with my children's prayers, with my brother's prayer, sister's prayer, father's prayer, whatever it happens to be. So we have these situations that, really, if we look at it from a human perspective, seem entirely destructive to the will of God or entirely destructive even just to their lives and, and maybe removing the will of God. Maybe you trust in the long-term will and plan of God and you sit there and go, I know he's going to figure it out, but for the present and for their life, all I see is struggle, destruction, or pain. So why isn't God doing something about it? And what we have to understand is that we have a promise from God. And even when People were asking the same thing of God related to their salvation. We have the people of God crying out after 600 years of silence from Micah until the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, which was not public. That was just between them, right? And then, you know, what did Joseph do? His initial knee-jerk reaction was, I'm just going to hide her away and divorce her quietly so she doesn't get killed for basically having fornication. And then the angel had to go to Joseph and he's like, nope, that's not wrong. I mean, you are wrong. That's not right. I am honoring my will to bring Jesus Christ through your betrothed wife. And this is my plan. And that it was only at that point that he then continued on in, <laughs> in doing what obviously was the will of God. Because we obviously are all saved. And we obviously know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and our Savior. But we look to it. People were crying out for an answer to be kind of removed from under the thumb of Rome. And that was what a lot of the Jews thought Jesus was, right? Palm Sunday. Within a week later, they're whipping him and pulling his beard and cheering, cheering with the rest of the crowd to say, crucify him, crucify him. We choose Barabbas, which is insanity, a murderer amongst their, in their midst. Because he just didn't do what they wanted when they expected him to do it. And he didn't come the way that they wanted. He came the way that he did, according to his work, according to his plan, according to his thousand years of prophecies so when we look to these situations we what we project what we think is best well believe you me before jesus christ came there were generations of jewish people that were asking the same question that we ask 
in a much more micro way. They were asking it in a much larger way where they sat there and said, why are we suffering? And it's not a new theme either, right? Because they're brought to Egypt basically by Joseph <laughs> and they, they, they are preserved by the grace of God, allowing the anger and the hatred and the jealousy of his brothers to bring him to Egypt, giving him the power of the interpretation of dreams, the power of leadership. He was not an average man. Go, go through his life. I, if I was put in the same situation without obviously taking into consideration the grace that God could extend me for that situation, just based on my responses in my personal life, I know I'm no Joseph. And it's not to sit there and say, I can't be one. I'm saying he had a special blessing on his life that when he went through all of these things and all of these sufferings, he just trusted and worked and he trusted and he worked. And no matter where he was, God put him in a position of authority. Even when he was in jail, the jailer went, oh, I can trust this other criminal to, to take care of the rest of the criminals. He'll keep them in line. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer of Joseph in his life. And God takes that situation. There's preserved by the death and the famine that took place throughout all of the Middle East, and then they become content in the land of Egypt, and then they become enslaved in the land of Egypt. And what do they do? They call out, God, what, where is our redemption? You know, where is our deliverance, God? We know it's coming. We heard of the prophecies. Where is it? They're even timing it. You read the Bible, they know. They know to almost the year. They're saying, it's been 400 years. We're here, we're waiting. Where's our redemption? And then comes in the form of Moses, in which they initially what? They reject, right? They sit there and they say, oh, well, you're free. What you, like, you were in the palace. You were in the house of, of, of Pharaoh. And you've come to us as a free man after leaving Egypt. We can't leave. You come back and you tell us that you're our deliverer. Get, get out of here. You haven't suffered like us. You haven't suffered with us. You haven't suffered through us. And God still uses him. And not the way that they wanted to see initially, but eventually, according to his will, it took place. Because remember after the, the ninth curse, the ninth, they all, all their workload is increased. All of it's made worse. And what do they say to Moses? We're better off if you never showed up. And this is after seeing multiple miracles. It's not like the frogs just randomly decide to jump out of the water and infest their, their, their palace on the whim of a man. It's not as though that anyone can just put their hand inside their, 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 their coat or their, their garment and pull it out and have it be covered in leprosy and then put back in. It's even though we have all of his sorcerers that are able to throw down their staffs and create snakes as well, they didn't, get, they didn't eat Moses' staff. It was the other way around. And so we saw multiple miracles that all these people would have seen at that point. And even at the ninth, they're sitting there going, it would be better if you just didn't show up here. And they're one miracle away, one test away, one tribulation away from freedom. And then, of course, we also see that generation's inclination to be unhappy and be complainers as they go through the wilderness. <laughs> Did you just bring us out here to die? <laughs> right? Everything's about us, right? Everything's about us. It's a condition that's within us that we must understand will always be present. We're never going to squash the flesh enough to not have a response like the Israelites did, to not have a response like the Jews did when Jesus came, to not have a response. Internally, we all have that response with certain situations in our life where we take liberty with our own personal emotions or our own personal opinion on when God should act and how he should be acting. And we can even sit there on a, on a, with, with a form of self-righteousness and sit there and say, well, I want this for your glory. I want this for your will. And in arrogance, we think we know better than God for the timing of what we know is good or righteous, but he hasn't done it yet. And so then we feel justified to sit there in our self-righteousness and say, I just want this to happen and I know it's a good thing, so why are you not doing it yet? Well, join the party. <laughs> the Jews and the Gentiles alike for thousands of years have been saying the exact same thing. And I won't go there, um, but you've heard it before. It said, um, in God's timing or in his perfect timing or in his right timing, God died and came to save sinners. It doesn't make sense, right? If we look at it from a personal perspective, 
thousands of people died without the, without the grace of God. There are millions of people in hell because Jesus Christ waited to come on the cross and pay for our sins. So why on earth would he wait? Why would he take his time? Well, we don't have all of the answers. We just know that it was his timing and it was his choice. Why doesn't God right now show himself across all the nations, remove every evil leader, and put a righteous man in, in, in position of every single country? He can, but he chooses not to. He uses evil and evil rulers to accomplish his sovereign will over nations time and time again. Again, just look to the history of what we find in the word of God. So we do, we sit here and we question God's timing. We don't question his will. We know his will is righteous. We know at the end of the day, God's will is going to be accomplished. For the most part, the conversations I've had with everyone that's here, we, none of you question that God's in control and God is going to accomplish his will. But we have the same question that all of us have. Well, why? Why wait? Why does this have to happen? Why go through this? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, that's a question I have when, when, when Trudeau was first elected. What are you doing? And it's, an, it's a fair question. I'm not, it's not as though because I'm a Christian, I can't ask these things. Of course I can, but I have to be satisfied with the answer that he provides. And that is that he allows for the evil rulers and the evil leadership to accomplish his righteous will, which doesn't make sense in our minds. But when we look to the history of what we find in the word of God has happened multiple times. Verses one through nine of second Peter verse uh, chapter three, second Peter chapter three. This is now beloved. Of course, beloved is he's talking to Christians. The second letter that I write to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and our Savior, spoken to the apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, so he's talking about the last days, like 2,000 years ago. The last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is this promise of this coming? That's what they say today, right? That's what they say today. Oh, you believe in that archaic thing called Christianity? Oh, yeah, and you think Jesus is going to come back eventually? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And you think that people get saved? Okay, yeah, okay. Where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. It's funny because we hear that message, right? Oh, well, it's been like this for thousands of years, and Jesus Christ still hasn't come. That's what they'll say. There are, there are people that will use that argument. But the crazy thing is they express it in the, in the, in the finite of the understanding of their knowledge, of their understanding of time. Time is this unbelievable thing that you and I have a projection on, right? I always have people come to me, they say, well, who created God? Well, you only project that God had to be created because you were created. The seed and the egg came together and then you had a time in which, bam, you exist. But God always existed. No one need to make him. He's always existed. There is no thing that he understands that is time. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He doesn't understand time the way that we understand time because if time was a line or a figure or a moment, he's outside of it. He's not within it. He's not bound by it. You and I have a day in which we were born and we have a day in which we will die. God does not. He's outside of that. So when we sit there and say, God, what is your timing on this? What is your timing on that? He's outside of it. He's beyond what we understand and what we see as time. And instead sits there and goes, we will allow for this to take place. And we will allow for all of these things to be, sorry, I'm admitting. Admit. Oh, why is it doing this? Admit all. There we go. And we sit there and go, why is it that he can't do this on my timing or my understanding or based on the knowledge of what I expect from God? It's because he's outside of it. When we look to it, we're asking the same question that many people have asked for thousands of years. And they say, just as it was from the beginning of creation, for when they maintain this, verse 5, it escapes their notice or their knowledge that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water and by water, which is really interesting because what was the first judgment of the world and its sin? Water. 
He used the very thing that shaped and he used to create this land to destroy it. And again, this is just my own personal projection. Um, you can spend a couple hours and, and look at it too. Um, I do not believe the pyramids were built by the Egyptians. I believe they found them. I believe they were already there. I believe that pre-flood, we had a level of technology and, and knowledge that you would have... Imagine living a, a, a 800 years. Imagine living 900 years. Imagine the knowledge that not only you could attain by just experimentation, but then by being handed down by the people that literally you can see four and five and six generations. And they're saying, this is how we did it and this is how you can improve upon it. There's, there's pyramids under the water. Under the water. Explain that. It's because they were here before the flood. And the landscape that we understand as, 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 and what we accept as continents and lands and land masses and water masses were not the same pre-flood. Those, those, those pyramids represent a period of time in which knowledge was easily handed through multiple generations. And I believe they probably exceeded the technology that we have today. And you can, again, you can spend the time looking at that yourself. <laughs> but I say that to say this, we have this understanding within our own minds and within our own heads in which we sit there and say, oh, why isn't God doing this? God is so far above that and so far beyond what we are thinking or what we can even comprehend that he turns us back to his word and back to what? His promises. Because we'll never understand exactly what it is that God's going through. We will never fully understand it. The only time we will is either when we die or he returns and we're in perfect relationship again with the perfect knowledge of God, literally hearing, resonating from the existence of his vibrance because there's no need for a sun in the new kingdom. Why? Because the, sun, the, the, the light emitting from the glory of God will light up the entire new world. That is the presence that we will be in in perfection with God when we die or when he returns. It says, through which in the world that time had been destroyed, being flooded with water, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved or preserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not, do not let this one fact escape your notice. So what's he saying? He's saying, focus in on this part of what I'm saying. Beloved, that with the Lord is one day is like a thousand years to man. And a thousand years to you is like one day for God. So imagine that. He's saying just to, just to give you an idea of the time scale equivalence. When you sit there and say, why God? Why are you taking so long? One of your days is like a thousand to God. So we sit there and they go, why have we suffered for 600 years? He's like, it hasn't even been a day. <laughs> if we're using that same kind of time, time comparison, right? And we sit there and go, oh, it's been so long since God created the earth. Actually, I think it's only been about 7,000 years, maybe 6,800 and something years. It's so funny because people sit there and go, oh, but science says that we can do carbon dating. No, go research carbon dating. We live in a young earth, a very young earth. We can have a complete transformation of what the earth looks like just with one volcanic activity. Go research Mount St. Helens. Whole community gone, changed. The whole earth completely manipulated and now it doesn't even look anything the same. And that happened in the 60s. Imagine that across the entire world. Imagine that across all of the continents, all of the oceans. We live on a very, very small earth. And we live on a very young earth in comparison to what they tell you. The Lord is not, and this is what we need to focus on, the Lord is not slow, verse 9, about his promise as some would count slowness but is instead patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And that's an interesting statement as well, because look, in verse seven, he said, well, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment for destruction of ungodly men. So what's he referring to? In God's eyes, in God's mind, and outside of time, because God doesn't understand time the way we understand time, he's above it and he's beyond it. It's really only a, something for us that he's created. He says, I know exactly whom it is that's going to be saved. I know exactly whom it is that's going to come to repentance. I know exactly who it is that's going to believe. And that hasn't been accomplished yet. So now, now it comes back to us. God, why have you not come back yet? Because you are selfishly thinking about your own life that isn't even in a position of true suffering or persecution. And you sit there and say, why me? Or let's say it is righteous. 
Let's say you are pained by what you see in the world, like I am pained by what you see in the world. The level, the, the hundreds of thousands of children that are aborted in Canada and the United States every year, and, 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 and year after year, all the slaughter of all these Christians throughout Egypt and, and Coptic Christians that were all slaughtered in Egypt and the Middle East as a whole and China and all these different places. We go, why God? Why are you waiting? Because he says to us, I still have a plan of salvation for millions of people. And it hasn't been accomplished yet. And the suffering and the death of other Christians may be the key to save even more. And so I will. And I will wait. And you will suffer. And you will die. And my will will be accomplished the exact same. And we're not in a position as Canadians where that's even a risk. I don't wake up in the morning and go, Ch -ch -ch. Okay, they might come for me today. <laughs> I don't. I'm not worried about death. I'm not worried about persecution. I'm not worried about anyone coming to me and saying, you will die because of what it is that you believe today. But that's the reality faced by millions of Christians today across the whole world. So the question of why do you wait, God, is answered right here. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is a promise from God on the lives of future Christians. And future from what we understand, because from God's understanding, he just hasn't saved them yet. As a matter of fact, depending on what you truly believe about the return of Jesus Christ, we may still be 40 years away. We might be 100 it's just the word that the Bible uses, a generation. This generation that sees this, and that is the creation of Israel as a nation. The generation that sees this will not perish. But if you go and talk to Coptic Jews within the, 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 uh, the Jewish state today, they reject the authority of Israel. They say it wasn't really established by God. So has it really been established as a nation? They don't think so. And they're the ones that are tracking it and tracing it through historicity that we are not. So is Israel even a nation today? I think it is. I do think Christ's return is close. But guess what? Pre-Nazism, pre pre-communism pre, um, uh, in, in Stalin, pre-Mao, pre, um, um, uh, pre-all these dictators, all these fascists, all these socialists, people were saying the same thing when we saw this large-scale sweeping of, of evil that you know, today's equivalent, I would say, is the World Economic Forum. And they said, Jesus must be coming back soon because look at all of this and let's align it with all of these different scriptures. We can be wrong about our interpretation of the timing of Christ's return because the timing of Christ's return, though we can recognize the signs, do not know the exact date. And so instead, what we have is we have a responsibility to understand that God is still saving souls. And whatever it is we have to go through and experience until he's accomplished his will in the most important thing of all, it is not righteous leadership through our government. It is not righteous leadership through our nation. It is not righteous leadership through our municipalities. It is souls being saved. Because where do you see the largest number of souls being saved? You know where the largest growing church in the world is right now? China. And they're persecuted. That's, that's insanity. So why would we sit there in our selfishness and say, God, I just pray that no one would have to suffer to be a Christian. He's saying my son suffered, my apostle suffered, my disciples suffered. All of the people through history that said they were my people suffered. The prophets suffered. They were killed with the sword. They were stoned. It's only our generation that sits there and goes, oh, as a Christian, I shouldn't have to suffer. Just read your Bible. We're just blessed to be living in the generation that we are. Turn with me also to James, chapter 1. Just back. James, chapter 1, verse 17. It says this, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life's lights, which, with whom, sorry, there is no variation or shifting shadow. It's funny, I, I speak to uh, some of my uh, more, I guess, more Pentecostal friends, or, or you could say more charismatic friends. And uh, they, they believe that God has this kind of shifting shadow. We don't know the will of God. We, we have to pray. And then and when we pray, then we just start seeing these manifestations. And then we know that that's the will of God. Come on. The will of God is expressed in us 
doing his work. That's the most basic way that you can understand the will of God. If you are preaching the word in an end of season, you are preparing to give an answer for the, for the, the truth that lies within you, the hope that lies within you, and you're actively seeking to see people saved through your actions, your words, your testimony, your sharing of what it is that you do, you know you're in the will of God. You look to the word of God and you see it says, don't do this and you don't do it, you're in the will of God. Outside of that, what's more important than knowing that you can have a testimony, telling other people about it, and seeing other people get saved? There's no greater will than that. But they have this idea, he's this, he's this shifting shadow. You know, God is so hard to, to pin down. He's so difficult to understand what it is that he wants from me or what it is that I should be doing. No, it's not. We only make it that way. We overcomplicate everything. That is all that we are good at, for the most part, as people. Because every time we try to take the word of God and change it, manipulate it, instead of just accepting it, what do we do? We add things to it. The Jews did it too. It's called the Talmud. They said the Torah is not good enough. We need the Talmud. And now, as Christians, we sit there and we say, well, the word of God isn't good enough. We need this new revelation. And we need this new commentary on how to explain this better because it definitely didn't mean that because look at how blessed my life is now. That's the old generation and that's the old dispensation. We need instead this new one that understands this about our life. And we just ignore so much of the truth of the word of God. Turn with me also to John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 verse 36. And actually, we'll start a little bit earlier. We'll start in 34. Jesus answered them and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, and the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does not remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. Wow. No wonder they wanted to kill him. <laughs> He's telling the very descendants of, 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 of God through Abraham that it's no longer about how you were born. It's about how you believe and what you believe. I speak the things which I have seen in my father. Therefore, also do these things which you have heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, then do the deeds of Abraham. He's literally telling them, you can be free from sin. Think about that picture. He's literally telling them, you can be free from sin. Free from the consequence of sin. Free from the burden of sin. Free from the punishment of sin. And they're sitting there saying, we don't need your freedom. We're the sons of Abraham. And he's literally God manifested in flesh. He's the God man. When we look to the scriptures and when we look to <clears throat> understanding God's promises for our life. And we look to understanding and just applying what it is that he wants from us. We have to understand that we're free. We're free because of the power of what Jesus Christ has done. We are free because of what Christ did on the cross. We are free because what he's done within us in the present. Is for, we're free because of what he's going to do for us in the future. And that even when the society over us takes some of our freedoms away, we're still free in salvation. We're free to be Christians. We're free to preach. Even when they tell us we can't, we can. Even if it means we die, then we're free from what? What, what, what Paul says, this body of flesh. This is just a covering for our spirit. And when we die, even no matter how painful of a death we might die, how easily of a death we might die, the bottom line is we're free. I face death. And I face death without fear of not knowing where it is that I would go. I face it knowing that when I die, I'll be absent from my body and my spirit will be present with the Lord. My second and final point, I'm only doing a two-point sermon, um, is that in understanding and knowing that God's promises are not slow, then how we must act. How should we act? Knowing his promises aren't slow, how should we act? Well, we should be acting fast. 
We should be using this as an opportunity to take advantage of the time that we have that God doesn't have. Because he's outside of it. And when I say that, I don't mean to say that he can't do something. That if you don't do it, he will just find somebody else. If you don't say that prayer, he'll find someone else. If you don't want to do that work, he will find someone else. He did that through all of history. Even to the point where he breaks from tradition and says, there's not a single man that can lead you properly. I'm sending you Deborah. And Deborah condemns everything. At all costs and at every turn, every single man that she has rule over, she says, it shouldn't be this way, but you're all a bunch of weak men. And God had to appoint me. And it's not even right, but he still did because I was willing and the hundreds of thousands of you were not. God will find whoever he needs to to accomplish his will. Even if it means breaking the mold of expectation of what it is that he has in a perfect position and a perfect um, plan. We, as Christians, have to understand that we have to act, and we have to act fast. And it's not because we're going to miss out on the overall, the sovereign will of God, but that you would miss out on the individual will of God. And that is evidenced all throughout Scripture. Specifically, again, talking about Deborah, it says, he tried calling you, and he tried calling you, and he tried calling you. And it says, I I can't remember, you'll have to go to it yourself in, in the book of Judges, but... He lists all these different numbers of times that he tried calling men. And they wouldn't. So we have to understand that we have to be steadfast. We have to be consistent. We have to be unmovable in what? In our actions. Not just our faith. Because again, what does it say? Faith without actions is dead. And he says, well, you show me your faith and I'll show you my actions. Oh, I'll show you my actions and then, and, and then you can show me your faith. And he's saying, no, no, no. They have to be working in conjunction with one another. You can't just say that you have faith in God and have no proof of it in the actions and the fruit of your life. And you can't just say that based on your actions and going to church that you're saved. You have to understand that it's both. Verses 14 through 18 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent diligent to be found in him in peace how do we how are we found in christ in peace are you at peace if you're doing none of the will of god no when are you at peace you're at peace when you're doing the will of god but the will of god is not always easy the will of god is not sitting down and doing nothing the will of god is not taking no action accomplishing the will of god that you would receive peace as a reward is action it's work Be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. How do you become spotless and blameless? You take actions to avoid sinfulness. You take actions to avoid what you know isn't the will or the purpose of God. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom that was given to him, wrote to you, as also in his letters, speaking to them these things in which are some things that are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort. So whether or not you want to believe that someone is or isn't a Christian is not the conversation that we're trying to have right now. But when we see people distorting the word of God, it tells us what? It says that their understanding is low and their understanding is low because they are untaught and because they are unstable. And the other thing that you find where people manipulate the word of God, a lot of them are unstable. If you go to um, the Church of Mormon, right? Is that Joseph Smith was their prophet? Read about his life. His entire life was unstable. <laughs> he was completely unhinged. <laughs> you, go to, you go to the Muslim faith and you go to look at what, the life of Muhammad. Exact same thing. Completely unhinged. Completely unstable. Living under rocks and in caves because even the people of his day were like, yo, this guy is whack. They, they sought to kill him. You look at Catholicism, and you look at what took place with Catholicism, and sure, every Catholic, um, um, what's it called when they get the army and they hold the cross in front of it, and then they go and slaughter a bunch of Muslims? What's it called? Crusade. Every crusade was a response of a jihad or some form of jihad. Yes, that's fine. But now you're playing tit for tat 
of two universalist religions that decide to take liberty with their prophets because the Catholic Church's prophets are not our prophets. The Catholic Church's prophets are their priests and the Pope. And whatever the Pope says is equivalent to what? If you, read their, if you go through their, their dogmatic, um, what's it called? Catechism. Catechisms, thank you. What does it say? The Pope is equivalent to Christ. So whatever the Pope says is greater than who? Christ. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in what we believe. They don't believe in the authority of the word of God that it's ended, that it's sealed, that it's complete. And so then you have all these people taking liberty with their unstable believers and their unstable leaders, the Pope on one side and whoever the king of the jihad is on the Muslim side, and they're slaughtering one another. They're all unstable. Have you been to war? I haven't. I've watched some movies on it. Pretty terrible. Overall. Very, un very, very terrible thing. Like all the things that are happening right now, Russia, Ukraine, all the different things that are happening in all these other different countries. There's lots of active wars. I think there's 40 active civil conflicts right now or, or, or cross-border conflicts right now where people are dying every single day. It's a terrible thing. You have to be unstable to send your people to fight in a war that you're not willing to fight in. Because that's what leaders do, right? And we have all these unstable, unknowledgeable, untaught people, but now let's bring it back down and focus in, magnify what it is here in the word of God. What will Christians and or maybe they're not Christians do with the word of God when they're unstable and untaught? They distort it. And that's what happens. Catholicism, Islam, Buddhism. I would, I would even in include multiple denominations of people that call themselves Christians, they're distorting the word of God. And how do they distort it? Well, they distort it with their minds. And then they just get enough people to agree with them. And then they've got enough people that agree with them that now it's a, it's a movement or it's a new denomination or it's, <laughs> it's another kind of angle of, of what that belief specifically is. As they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. It destroys their life. Even if they are genuinely saved, it destroys their life. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard so that you are not carried away by the error and the unprincipled men who fall from their own steadfastness. Ah, what's the key? Steadfastness. What is steadfastness? Steadfastness is habits, patterns, and actions that are done consistently every single day. Every day. You know, eating for us is steadfast, but it's because we have a mechanism within our stomach that is almost more powerful than anything else that says, whew, you know, you need to eat right now. I do intermittent fasting, and, and the first two or three weeks that you try intermittent fasting, it is everything to not eat before 12 or 1 o'clock. You're like, oh my goodness, I just need to chew something. I know you're chewing gum, and you're just drinking tons and copious amounts of water and, and anything else, and I don't drink gum. Uh, coffee, but if I did, I would probably drink a lot of coffee. Maybe put butter in it too to make it feel like it's more something on your stomach. But about three weeks later, guess what? It's completely normal. It's completely normal. You actually go to eat before 12, maybe you're not thinking, you go, ooh, that feels heavy on my stomach. It doesn't quite feel the same way that it did three or four weeks prior before you created that pattern and created that habit to then train your body and train your mind and take control of it. And we're supposed to be doing the same thing, except instead of taking control of our mind, we're supposed to be giving control to the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be giving that control to the Word of God. And then we make our actions line up with what it is we know to be true as a promise from God. And he tells us what? The Word of God will never return void. So we do what? We read it every single day. And he says, these, the words of these books shall never pass from you or should never uh, pass from the, from the lips of your mouth. So we should be speaking the Word of God. We should be speaking it out louder or we should be preaching it or we should be going and attending preaching or whatever it happens to be. And it says, if you study this Word, you will, ne you, you will not suffer as much. You will understand more. So we start studying the Word of God. Then it says, you must pray and when you pray, God will hear you and he will answer your prayers. You will be in commitment with him and the Holy Spirit that is within you will speak words that you don't even need to utter because it's beyond the understanding of the utterance of a single language because it's a spiritual cry from your heart. So pray. 
And we consistently start to do all of these things and we remain principled and we remain steadfast in these actions. And the Bible tells us here in verse 18 that you will grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it says to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. It's funny because failure is easy, but success is too. And we just make it out to be harder in our head because the delayed failure is far greater than the delayed gratification when it comes to the, the, the wretchedness it creates in our soul. And what I mean by that is this. When you fail to read your Bible, when you fail to pray, when you fail to study it, when you fail to do all the things that the Bible requires of us, your suffering isn't until later, but it's greater. You say, oh, you know, I didn't have time to do that. Instead, I, I read a book. Or I didn't have time to do that. Instead, I went and... And it can, it can be something nice, too. Oh, I went and played with my children. So you can justify it any different ways. Oh, I'm so busy. You know, I have to go to work and I have to supply for my needs for the family so I don't have time to read my Bible. Well, you're, you're putting the, the locomotive at the back. You're putting the caboose in the front. And you're going to suffer. How are you going to suffer? You're going to crash. <laughs> Eventually, spiritually, you're going to crash because you're not doing it in the order and God outlaid for us. Give us this day our daily bread. So we go up in the morning and we read our Bible. Pray. How do we pray? This is how you pray. And then we have examples of prayer. We have examples of Paul praying. We have examples of Peter praying. We have examples of Jesus Christ praying. You do all of these things and you create this steadfastness, this habitual action taking in your life every single day and you will start to see the rewards of that. Just organically. And the exchange that we now have for delayed failure and delayed pain in disobedience in which I can only guess what the future holds... But instead, to sacrifice some little bit of time in my morning and my little bit of time before I, I eat and I pray and a little bit of time before I go to bed and I pray, I know that I have this delayed gratification coming for me that can be such a blessing that I don't even know, I'm not even fully aware of it because my life is at a completely different level, a completely different echelon because I've consistently applied these things. And I think we see it. We see it in the lives of, of people that we would consider wise or righteous. We say, you know what? Their marriage is good. You know what? They always look happy. You know what? They look like they enjoy one another's company. Oh, you know what? That man lost his wife and look, he still has joy. He still has contentment. He still preaches or he still works or he still witnesses or he still does all of those things because they've understood that the steadfast of prayer, reading your Bible and studying the word of God is something that has a reward that disobedience never will have. It will never have. And so we exchange the kind of delayed gratification that we have, one that ends in pain and suffering that is self-inflicted, to one that can still obviously end in some sort of persecution or tribulation, but brings us towards righteousness, shapes us and molds us. And the way that I would describe it is these two different things, is you have metal. You know that metal, when it oxidizes, it actually, it's chewing itself. The oxidization process is metal chewing itself. And so let's say that you are a sword and you just sit there and you're doing nothing. Eventually, with the right conditions, it just, you just start eating away at yourself. You just start chewing yourself away. We talked about it last week again, uh, last week a little bit. We're going to mention it again today. If you're not growing, you're dying. And I truly believe that. I don't believe that there's a, a, a coasting in this Christian walk. I believe instead you only have, uh, you only have this, this, this taking away. You only have this, this kind of dying, spiritual dying or, or depreciation of what could be because you've chosen not to grow. And I've seen it in multiple examples of many Christians that just gave up and said, I'm done trying to work on myself anymore. I've come so far, it's exhausting. And then I see people who used to be completely convicted or sorry, completely delivered of, of, of alcohol go back to it. I've seen people that were completely delivered from sexual sin be, go back to it. I see all these people that were delivered from all of these things fall right back into it because they're not actively working and being steadfast in their job. They're just like this sword that sits in the humidity of its existence and starts <laughs> eating and chewing away itself. But what does the Bible tell us? It says that the countenance of a brother or accountability of a brother is like iron sharpening iron and that's what our life is supposed to be like it won't be easy 
How do you shape a sword? Heat, banging, sharpening. But at the end of the day, when the sword is done, it's better for it. The samurai sword, I don't know how, you know, how they do it technically. They fold it over, and then they fold it over, and then they fold it over. And I don't know how many times they fold it over, but for someone at some point decided, I'm going to start folding over a sword, and I'm going to just keep folding it over to a certain point, and then we're going to see what we get. Samurai swords literally are, like, even, even bullets in some cases, obviously, kind of bullet probably would, but even bullets in some cases can't break it and bend it because it's been folded over and folded over and folded over and obviously there's a process heating and cooling and banging and hitting and shaping and molding and sharpening but they do it over and over and over again at the end of the day the sword is better for it the result the end result is better for it if you spoke to the sword and it had a personality it would say what what on earth are you doing to me because it's not even a sword it's just a chunk of metal and that chunk of metal, like us, would be content just to stay in the ground and be who we would be. But God has greater plans for you and for me. And that plan might mean some molding and some shaping. It might mean some heat and then some cold and then some heat and then some hitting and then some cold and then some heat and then some sharpening and then back into the mold and all of these different things. And sorry to say... It doesn't stop when you're 30 or 40 or 50. It will happen your entire life because God is perfecting you your entire existence. Because guess what? Though our flesh here is temporal and will come to an end, our spirit is eternal. And read Revelation and read what we have about the, about the, the new kingdom. You will be appointed to positions based on your temporal performance of how you existed here. So that when God starts molding you and shaping you, when he starts banging you and heating you up and shocking you with cold, don't kick against it. Embrace it. Find purpose in it. And then channel it towards what I can do for the will of God. If not today, maybe tomorrow. Maybe you need to heal. Maybe you need to, to, to take a little bit of time. But in all of those things, understand one thing. It's leading us towards a steadfastness, leading us towards a kind of maturity or perfection in a relationship with God that will never return void. Because you and I, are merely slaves to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he will have his way with us. He will, except we have a loving Father and a Lord. Not one who wishes just to abuse our bodies and abuse our power that we have here on this earth, but instead one that wishes to nurture it for his kingdom. One that wishes to build us up in his spirit and in his power. One that says, you can ask me any question that you want, but don't stop working. Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading. Don't stop studying because you are my workmanship. That's what he tells us. You are my workmanship. Well, what does a workman do? No matter what it is, swordsmith, blacksmith, carpenter, mechanic, any smith of any kind, any workman of any kind, what do they do? They take something that is raw and is of no use and they turn it into something that is useful. And that's what God is doing with the hearts and the bodies and our souls of every single person that's here. And it's not just for our time here. Stop, stop taking your scope and saying, when I'm 90, I'll be useless. Or when I'm 100, I'll be useless because my body is broken. No, you are living beyond your body. You are living in a spirit sense that goes past and beyond that. And the temporal, this is the crazy thought. The temporal, the beginning and the end of the time that we understand here on this earth affects eternity forever. Forever. Whether it's people being saved by your witness, whether it's children that you taught, the, 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 the power of it is to believe in the power, or the power and knowledge of Jesus Christ that then have children that get saved and grandchildren and great-grandchildren grandchildren that get saved if Jesus should tarry. Genesis 12, 1, it says, Abraham was gone and sent by God to another land. So he went, he would go. Exodus 32, the Lord said to Moses, Go to Egypt. Joshua 1, the Lord told Joshua, go to the promised land. Matthew 28, he tells his disciples, which is us too. 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every single powerful image of man that we have in the history of the Word of God was a goer, was a doer, was an action taker. Even when they made tons of mistakes. Jacob, mistakes. Abraham, tons of mistakes. <laughs> Joshua, mistakes. They all made mistakes. But what defined them? They didn't stop. They didn't make a mistake and then go, oh, I'm useless. Can't do anything for God anymore. They received the repercussions from him. They received that, 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 um, that tongue lashing, or in some cases, the punishment, David and Bathsheba, the death of his son. And they made a change. They moved forwards and they took action to be better. And we have to do the exact same thing. God requires action of all of us. And for us, the actions that we take with our convictions are greater than any physical movement that we see in the Old Testament. We have to take those actions within ourselves. Build convictions in your life. Say, this is what I will not do because I am a Christian. This is what I will work on because I'm a Christian. This is the next the next peak, the next pinnacle in which I will traverse with my relationship with God to conquer so that I can be more like him. Because our Christianity is a process and the process is empowered by the Holy Spirit and we have to remember that. And when we do and when we understand that, we understand his promises give us the power to take action and that action produces fruit and that fruit then has a delayed gratification that affects not just our life but the lives of our children, our grandchildren, potentially even our great-grandchildren. We will remain diligent in it because our scope is beyond this earth and beyond this time. It's echoing into eternity because that's what we're doing here every single day. Please bow your heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your word for your message in it, that we, Father, can be challenged by it, but also that, more importantly, we can be comforted by your word, comforted by your Holy Spirit, comforted in the knowledge that we aren't made into a position where we can't accomplish these things, but instead, we've actually been given the power, the freedom, as Jesus Christ said there in John, we have been given the freedom from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin or to our sin nature. We've been given the power through God. Might that be a testimony of our lives, Father God, as we continue to express our love to you and express, reciprocate, that we would reciprocate that love to you. And we ask it according to your will and your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Number 456. Nothing. 456. Yeah, good afternoon almost, buddy. <laughs> My Jesus, I love you. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We'll sing all four verses of 456. My Jesus, I love thee. Please stay. Yeah. Hey.
Thank you for the time in which we've been able to express our love towards you in song and in spirit, in preaching, Father God, and also in the acceptance of what it is the word has to say for us today. We thank you that we can leave this place and know that you have a protection hand upon us, that from the top of our head to the tips of our toes, and no weapon formed against us shall prosper except that which God has planned and purposed for his will and his purpose. The fiery darts of the enemy will not puncture and, and, and go beyond what it is that we know is the armor of God in which we put it on every single day in prayer and in reading of the word and the actions and the action takers of what it is to accomplish your will in our lives personally. And we thank you, Father God, according to your will and your purpose for all of these things and pray that we have divine appointments and opportunities set before us as we go out this week. We have the opportunities ourselves, Father, be witnesses of what it is that Jesus Christ has done within our souls. And let us not be selfish and let us not be rebellious in, in, in restraining ourselves from doing what we know is right and doing what we know is pure. And instead, Father God, focus on those things and focus on ad taking the action to do those things. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.